at the end of verse 16, yet will I be to them as a little sanctuary. It doesn't mean little in the sense of small. That even though God would destroy the temple and that there would no longer be that temple for 70 plus years, that God himself would be the sanctuary of his people. That's what we find with Daniel. When he was taken into the captivity, he opened his windows three times a day. He prayed toward Jerusalem. There was no longer a temple there. But the Lord was his sanctuary. And it's a reminder that God is not limited to time and place. And that wherever his people are, I think of some even today that don't have a place of worship as we enjoy here. And they're in remote places. They're thankful that they can connect with us over the internet and be able to enter in with us, but they're in places where they don't have the fellowship that we enjoy. And yet the Lord is their sanctuary. The altar hasn't changed, that's Christ. The sacrifice hasn't changed, that's Christ. And the scriptures are clear, let us enter boldly into his presence that we might find grace to help in time of need. That's speaking of those for whom the Lord is that sanctuary. When it says here, I believe that yet will I be to them a little sanctuary, I believe that should be translated in the, in, in the sense of a little while. That this is only for a little while that I will need to be for them that sanctuary where they're dispersed throughout the nations because I'm going to bring back a remnant and the temple will re be, be rebuilt until such time as the Lord Jesus would come into the world and fulfill it all. And so verses 17 to 21, here's where we see God's promise to restore Israel to the land and renew them, not just restore them, but renew them spiritually. There's a twofold fulfillment here. Now, he's speaking about his generation. A lot of people read this as some future time at the end of time when God's going to restore Israel again as a nation. No, this is talking about being restored after the 70 years captivity. So after the important thing with interpretation of Scripture, three important points. Context, context, context. <laughs> context here, when he says in verse 17, Therefore say, thus saith the Lord God, I will even gather you from the people." and assemble you out of the countries where you have been scattered, and I will give you the land of Israel. There are some that like to preach that this was a promise that was suspended all the way up until 1948. And then in 1948, God brought Israel back into the land. Now, this is talking about in the time of Ezekiel, that after the 70 years captivity, he would bring them back. And they shall come thither, and they shall take away all the detestable things thereof and all the abominations thereof from thence. Remember when we studied Ezra and Nehemiah, what was the first thing they did was clean up the idolatry of the land and then laid the foundation again for the temple. That's what he's talking about. But there's a spiritual side to this as well. It's not just a national returning when when it per pertains to the remnant it says here and I will give them one heart this would be the Ezra's and the Nehemiah's and those of that day it wasn't everybody but it was those that were the remnant according to the election of grace the Lord gave them one heart and I will put a new spirit within you and I will take the stony heart of their flesh and will give them a heart of flesh and that they may walk in my statutes and keep mine ordinances and do them and they shall be my people and I will be their God. But as for them whose heart walketh after the heart of their detestable things and their abominations, I will recompense their way upon their own heads, saith the Lord God. There's only really two types of people. Those to whom God has given that new heart and certainly that's what we find when we get to the New Testament that was fulfilled in that covenant that Christ came and established for his true Israel. Paul wrote about that in Romans 2. Who is a Jew but one that is inwardly of the heart, not outwardly, but inwardly. 
So that's one category of people that you'll always see down through history, those who are the Lord's and he's purposed to preserve by his grace and given his spirit that they might know him through his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. The rest, in verse 21, left to themselves, people always argue, well, I wish God would just leave the choice to us. Well, guess what? If he does, you'll be condemned because you'll always walk after your heart and after the detestable things and the abominations. And, the, and that's where the Lord says, I will recompense their way upon their own heads, saith the Lord. The only reason any of us are saved is because God laid that charge to his son for those that he's purposed to save. But those that are his, he gives them that one heart and puts within them that new spirit that they might truly know him and walk in his way, which is the way of the Lord Jesus Christ. And then we come to verses 22 and 23, where again we see this revelation of the glory of the Lord departing from that temple, God removing that glory. Why? Because he's about ready to destroy it. Remember I said that there were three particular exiles with Nebuchadnezzar. And the third time that he came down into that land, he would destroy that temple in that city. But even before then, God has, had already removed his hand. He was working already in raising up Nebuchadnezzar to come in condemnation. But here we read, Then did the cherubims lift up their wings... Then he sees this vision again of the wheel and the wheels beside them. That's his providence. The cherubims representing God's presence in worship. And what? The glory of the God of Israel was over them above. And the glory of the Lord went up from the midst of the city. The glory of the Lord removed, was removed. God was removing his hand from that city. And stood upon the mountain which is on the east side of the city. It's interesting that that mountain is the Mount of Olives. That's where the glory was removed. And then we don't read any more where it went from there other than it had been removed from the city. But I'll tell you when the Lord brought that glory back was when he brought his son, the Lord Jesus Christ, into the world. And where did our Lord retire if you will and go aside to pray it was on that mount of olives and the garden of gethsemane was right at the base of that mountain and what did where did christ pray his prayer in john 17 right there that he said that he prayed that that god would manifest his glory unto his people with that glory that he had had with his father even before the world began that's when the glory of the lord was brought back in. It was in the presence and the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. But until that time, from this time all the way till then, the glory of the Lord was removed. People keep talking today about Israel, national Israel, being God's favored son and still his, God has a purpose. No, that glory was removed. And the only way that that glory has ever been brought back is in the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's God's true Israel. And so here again, we see afterwards the Spirit, should be capital S, took me up and brought me in a vision by the Spirit of God into Chaldea. He never left Chaldea. Chaldea is Babylon. He didn't physically ever leave to go back to Jerusalem. But in the Spirit, he was taken up. And, and the Spirit of God brought him again back to where he was, to them of the captivity. So the vision that I had seen went up from me. And then I spake unto them of the captivity what all the things that the Lord had showed me. There again, one who's a true servant of God does not declare his own words or speculations or imaginations, but he declares what the Lord has clearly revealed in his word. I'm thankful for the word because this was written over 2,500 years ago, and here it is. <laughs> it's been preserved for us, and we're reading it now. God hasn't changed. He's still the same God. 
and uh, he saves his people according to his grace and mercy. Gracious Father, thank you for your word. I pray that you would bless it even as we've heard it and it calmed our hearts. Stir up the follow ground that uh, our hearts would be apart from your spirit working. And uh, may we truly worship you through your son, the Lord Jesus Christ. We give you the praise, honor, and glory in his precious name. Amen.